from where I stand, there's, it's a big win for transparency and trust. So docs know exactly where they stand on RVUs at any given point. Change in human behavior, it's always a little bit tough, but it's got to start somewhere and it's got to be informed by data. And that's what this process really helped us with. When it comes to cardiovascular care, on the organizational level, Medaxium, an ACC company, understands the challenges your program is facing. Welcome to Medaxium Heart Talk, the podcast where thought leaders come together for one ultimate goal, to continually transform and optimize cardiovascular care for all. Medaxium Heart Talk starts now. I'm Cheryl Toth, host of Medaxium Heart Talk. If you're trying to balance optimal staffing and cost efficiency, or looking for ways to improve physician productivity and volumes, or use advanced practice providers more effectively, you're going to really enjoy today's episode. With us are two guests from Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute, part of Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina, cardiologist and president, Dr. Jeffrey Rose, and assistant vice president, Bart Reeves. They've spent the last four or five years using a data-driven approach to right-sizing the staff. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being our guests on MedAxiom Heart Talk. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Well, we thought it would be a good idea to start by giving listeners a sense of the size and scope of Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute. How many physicians, locations? Give us a sense of that, would you? Sure. So uh, Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute, uh, we're located in principally in Charlotte, North Carolina, and provide cardiovascular services for the region. Um, That includes uh, adult cardiology, pediatric cardiology, vascular surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, and uh, pediatric uh, cardiovascular surgery. So in, in all uh, approximately 120 physicians and 90 APPs in terms of scope and uh, service a, a number of uh, hospital facilities for inpatient care in the Charlotte area and uh, about 25 care locations in the greater Charlotte area. Wow, so great reach, 25 locations. That's terrific. Well, we know from MedAxiom's top of mind survey results that a lot of our members are. Uh, challenged with staffing issues. Was there a defining moment that got your organization to focus on this? What what kind of was that moment where you said, hey, we've got to look at how to appropriately staff? Well, may, maybe I'll start here and then I'll I'll ask Bart to to jump in because he really brought the, you know, the the business expertise to looking at this question. But As I just mentioned, the fact that we've got 25 locations presents a real challenge for figuring out what is the right staff because, you know, some some offices are uh, attached to quaternary care hospitals, so the scope of services, the number of providers is very different than, you know, perhaps a smaller practice that is serving at one of our regional hospitals. And to have the, you know, the one size fits all methodology just didn't seem to work. And when we took a step back and looked at how we were staffing our offices, the the number of um, medical assistants we had, the number of nurses, ratios and things like that, we quite frankly found we were all over the map. And, 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 And of course, every office thought they were doing it right because things seemed to be working. So that was really, I think, eye-opening for us was that there was an opportunity for us not necessarily to make everything cookie cutter, but but to constrain the variation to some degree. And you know, and that's where, you know, Bart uh, really comes in with the lens that he put uh, to focus on this problem. So going into the budget process uh, back in in 2018, we took we took a step back as a as a heart and vascular group, and we said the same uh, outpatient visits per staff FT metric that we've been using for years alongside our medical group primary care type partners just wasn't working for us. We, you know, one size doesn't fit all, you know, you can't, you can't say, okay, we want to shoot for 500 outpatient visits per staff FT and just let that be an overarching goal for our entire heart and vascular Institute. So how can we segment our practices into our large tertiary practices are kind of medium-sized practices uh, that that either have imaging or don't have imaging attached to the practice because that makes a difference in how you staff. And then plus our, our smaller practices that have 
minimum staffing levels, right? You got one doc in a practice. You can't just have one staff member. You need three or four to be able to run a practice. So mm -hmm. the first thing we did is we segmented out kind of what were like peer groups within our adult cardiology footprint. And then we, then we did the work to say, okay, well, within these groups, how does your staff FTs per 10,000 RVUs match up to the other peers within that, that peer group? And what we really found is that there are variances in how many nurses practice A has versus practice B, or how many CMAs of you know, practice B has versus practice C. And then some of the front office and back office uh, functions as well just vary wildly from practice to practice. So we were able to kind of take a, what, what is it, how many staff FTs does it require to create 10,000 RVUs in a practice in a year, which is about one FT, one physician FT's worth of productivity. And just um, took that discipline, set targets, um, started some monthly reporting around those metrics, and then just really drove change across our entire footprint by just comparing, contrasting, why do we do things this way in this practice versus this way in another practice, and just kind of kind of set some guardrails as, as far as that goes. I love that what you did was really create like your own, you're so big, you created a benchmarking system for yourself and looked at how does each location perform against the other and looking at the variance against that 10,000 RVUs. That was, that's so interesting. And I think most practice administrators, I, I was in part of your presentation at CV Trends Forum, they would kill for the data and the dashboards you use to do this. So I was curious how you how the um, this variance and the analysis and all of these things kind of rolled into these dashboards that you've been using to manage. Could you tell us about that? Who was the architect? Was that you, Bart? Or how did those come to yeah. be? Uh, yeah. yeah, that was Bart. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it, it was me. Uh, you know, we, we um, as a as a atrium system, as a larger system, we, we started to dabble in that staff FTs per 10,000 RVUs back in probably the summer of 17, it must have been. You know, again, in, in just one day, I, I had a little bit of extra capacity. So, I, in, in terms of my, my workload, so I just went to work on a dashboard and created it in about a, about a half a day, at least to got it 95% of the way there. And you know, it, it it was just you know setting up the the first practice, uh, and then you kind of scaled it across our other 12 or 15 adult cardiology practices at the time. So, it, it was just a homegrown tool, but you know, the the tool has it's been consistent now for, you know, going on two plus years. And so it's been circulated within our system. There's been trust around the system that's being created around it. You know, when budget time came around for 2020, uh, folks knew, knew the tool and, you know, I say folks outside of SHVI that were helping us create the budget. So they trusted it they've spread it to other divisions in our, in our system. So it was a homegrown tool. I've gotten it to the point where it takes me 30 minutes or an hour, an hour per month to update. And then I could blast it out to our leadership team and, and beyond so that folks can know exactly where we stand on our productivity on any given month. And it's meaningful to us. It helps us drive conversations within the Institute about how we're staffed. And it's, it's uh, I think, bought us a little bit of capital around the system to say that these guys have a lot of great discipline around their staffing practices. You know, let's, when, when they come to ask for an extra FT or when they say, you know, can we move this budget from this practice to that practice? There's really no questions asked. It's just kind of a, a foregone conclusion that we've already done our homework and our process is trusted and that kind of thing. So, well, and Dr. Rose, yeah. how how have the physicians reacted to this data and seeing it out there plainly in this process? Well, very positively. I mean, I think that there's a couple of points to to amplify. So, first off. You know, having an external benchmark and and you know looking at data that we can get from MedAxiom and and other sources gives us some frame of reference where all in as an institute where should we be? So if that's you know three staff per 10,000 RVUs, that gives us a place to begin from. And then you know with the the segmentation of like practices within our institute that was very helpful to us as well because there's as, as Bart mentioned, there's certain efficiencies or economies of scale that you're going to get in a very large, um, you know, practice that you're just not going to get in a one or two person practice. You need, you know, you need a check-in person, you need a nurse, you need a staff. Your staffing ratios are going to be upside down. Mm -hmm. But, but there, there should be within that group of practices, there should be some similarities, and that was really the key observation here. 
and you know the ability to sort of stratify our practices into those three different buckets. Then from there, it, it becomes an exercise in just keeping score. And you know, with the information systems we have, and with Bart's expertise and our our, our folks to be able to get the right data flowing into it, it really became. Uh, you know, actionable information. And, and that's really what I think the providers are looking for because we, we practice in a complex environment that a lot of time feels out of our control, you know, particularly those of us in integrated healthcare systems. And um, the ability to understand the environment, know where we are with respect to staffing uh, ratios really builds a lot of internal credibility and as Bart mentioned, a lot of external credibility, because now when we're having FTE conversations, we know what we need. Our physicians and, and other staff know when we're you know, in need of additional support, but most importantly, others in the organization uh, outside of the Heart and Vascular Institute also understand that. So we found it to be a real effective tool for just the, you know, the mechanics of practice management. Mm -hmm. Oh, it sounds like it acts like a blueprint almost. So you've got this all set up and you know when you're low or high or, you know, because you've done all this foundational work. No, absolutely. And because we are, you know, an institute across a geographic footprint, I mean, the reality is that one of our staff might join us in an office in one area of Charlotte, but, you know, decide that they want to move somewhere else and, you know, they're, a great, great person to be with our organization. It allows us to be able to look to see where we have opportunities. It really allows us to be more fluid with our personnel and, you know, allowing movement, uh, you know, across borders uh, of practices rather than each one being sort of a walled off unit. Mm -hmm. And I think that that type of fluidity is really important because it just gives you a lot more flexibility. And that should be one of the advantages of being bigger is having that capacity to manage, you know, various contexts that you can't predict. Well, speaking of opportunities and what you can see in the data, you found that you got three times the production per FTE with advanced practice providers, even as FTEs increased by 50%. So tell us about that and what the secret was to getting all of that productivity yeah, sure. Yeah, so this is so this has a, been a journey for us uh, dating back to at least the 2014 when uh, w when some new leadership came into place. But and we we've been working on uh, certainly APP productivity for a long time. But our our baseline RVUs per APP FT was 752 back in 2014 when we started tracking it in a detailed manner. Mm -hmm. It's now as of the end of 2019 uh, almost 2200. So, so we've what we've seen across our institute is as we've scaled, uh, especially over that five to six year period, we've we've added you know a, a good bit of APP FTS. I think it was you know eight or ten APP FTS over this particular time frame, but we've only added one or two docs. And what we've seen is a twenty percent RVU increase over that same time period. So we've we've gone. I think it was from seven hundred thousand RVUs to eight hundred fifty thousand RVUs in a five year period with only adding one doc. Right. Yeah. And, a, and a lot of it's just top of license work for your APPs. It's putting in place, you know, models for your APPs where they're doing return visits in the office while new while physicians see new patients. It's it's uh, you know, team team based care in the inpatient space. It's, you know, getting your docs out of the clinic when you can to get them into procedural or imaging spaces. And it's it's really just part of the team based care that, that Dr. Rose has helped implement over the past several years. Well, that's pretty extraordinary that increase with only one physician increasing and going from up to 850,000 RVUs. Dr. Rose, what are some of the lessons you learned along the way and how, how you achieved that? How did you, how did you lead that with your peers? I think it just comes back to really leaning into team-based care. So, you know, when you look at it and from the, the data that we presented um, recently, so one doc in eight APPs was, I think, 140,000 RVUs, if memory serves. Right. So, you know, just crazy numbers for nine, nine people, eight of whom are APPs. But uh, Bart mentioned it. What it really did was unlock the potential for the physicians to be doing higher value work, seeing new patients, being in, uh, you know, the imaging labs, being in the procedural labs, serving our patients, and at the same time, 
having the patient's care really advance as well with respect to APPs working at top of license. And, you know, I think the thing that also goes along with this that's important is that from a press gainy standpoint, our patient satisfaction has been top decile. And we saw our provider uh, engagement as well move up from 2013 to 25th percentile to, you know, now top quartile. Uh, I think we were 82nd percentile. So still more work to do. But if, if we just look at it from a, are people happy with this? Um, from a provider standpoint and, you know, provider wellness and that lens, the answer would be yes. From a patient standpoint, the answer would be yes. And, you know, we think we're able to provide better and more timely care. And then it certainly works from a, you know, practice management standpoint, particularly in any place where, you know, which most cardiology practices with the aging of the population are experiencing, which is, you know, how are we going to serve all the patients who need us? Mm -hmm. and, and, and in order to do that, everybody on the team has to be operating at top of license. We talk about it all the time, actually doing it. Uh, this would be, you know, maybe an N of one experiment, but I will just, you know, provide that, you know, testament that it, that it can work. And uh, this is a situation where, um, you know, we always had APPs, our APPs were always working. No one was ever lax or, you know, drinking coffee and not doing work. But what was happening was we were doing double work. The APP would see the patient, the doc would see the same patient and maybe redo the whole, you know, uh, process. And we, we really now have gotten work to where it needs to be. And, you know, I think we've seen the dividends, like I said, in the experience of care, the quality of care, and equally important, the experience of care, the experience of the care provider. Terrific. All the, all the numbers are up and the ex patient experience is up too, as well as physician engagement. So that is a huge win. I want to take a break for a few minutes and then we're going to come back and talk with you a little bit more about workflow. You just sort of mentioned it with the uh, APPs and we'll talk a little bit more about the physician compensation scorecard. So stay with us. This is MedAxiom Heart Talk. Many programs have added scribes to their delivery team to manage the important yet cumbersome clinic documentation within their practices. Join us on Thursday, February 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern for the process and benefits of adding a scribe to the delivery team webinar. MedAxiom's Ginger Beesbrock, Senior Vice President Consulting, will cover the basics of scribe implementation and processes, and you'll hear from New Mexico Heart Institute, a program that has successfully utilized scribes with an overview of their current state. To register, go to medaxium.com and click on events. We're back and we're talking with Dr. Jeffrey Rose and Bart Reeves from Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'd like to kind of move toward this physician compensation scorecard that you talked about in your presentation last fall. Obviously, with all this increase in work RVUs and productivity, compensation would be a positive result. So um, Dr. Rose, can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of it and then how it's used to communicate with physicians with regard to RVUs and staffing? Yes, yeah, certainly. And I'll, I'll you know, begin and, and certainly welcome Bart's comments as well. But I think the, the genesis of this, once again, we are a, a practice in an integrated healthcare system. So it's really key for us to be able to provide transparency back to our physicians in terms of uh, our performance. And um, although we are not 100% RVU based, RVUs are a portion of how we determine compensation for our physicians. So it began with just the, you know, the thought that we really need to have some vehicle that physicians would know where they stand uh, on a monthly basis with respect to all the things that drive their compensation. So um, with, uh, you know, BART at the helm, we were able to design uh, scorecards that were able to automate and produce monthly that uh, categorizes the amount of RVUs that the, that the physician has performed in the past month. The, it also provides on a, a 
total of uh, on a monthly basis the previous 11 months. So the, they're always looking at a snapshot of 12 month performance. Mm -hmm. So we have that. And then in addition, uh, we have a variety of metrics that are tied into bonus compensation that have nothing to do with productivity, but are around quality and service and patient satisfaction and where we stand on that, whether it's you know, our cardiovascular readmission rate or what have you, we provide that feedback each month. So each month, the physician gets a scorecard, comes electronically to their you know, personal uh, system email that says kind of where things stand. And then our, our division leaders are also looking at those scorecards as well because we want to make sure that people are where they want to be with respect to um, you know, their productivity and, and performance. So it really gives us some insight. There's no surprise at the end of the year where people are. Everybody knows every month where things stand. And we've tried to develop a culture as well that if people are finding issues with opportunity or anything, that they now have a, you know, uh, an open door to discuss those things that we're never having any sort of last minute conversations about this kind of stuff. Bart, I wondered if you, when you, as you elaborate, you can tell me, tell us a little bit about what you feel are the biggest wins for you in sure. developing this uh, scorecard and how you can communicate the data to the doctors. Sure. So, so uh, as Dr. Rose mentioned, this is this is kind of a big win for our providers. So we have, as we, as we mentioned, over 100 docs, and thus we have over 100 scorecards. So you can imagine an Excel spreadsheet with 100, 120 tabs on it. Uh, each month we go in and and we when we plug in the most recent month's data, we take away the the third, you know, the the 12 months ago data, and we always have a 12 month rolling snapshot of information. But for me, it's from where I stand, there's it's a big win for transparency and trust. So so docs know exactly where they stand on RVUs at any given point. They see some of the peaks and the valleys of when I took vacation last year versus when I had a really busy month and produced mm -hmm. 1,200 RVUs in a single month and and then there's no surprises that we, we report their patient satisfaction each and every month. And we report the APP productivity and then things like new patient visit growth and, and the most important being the quality metrics. So it's, it's a really good way to, and, and this takes me a day a month probably, you know, a day's worth of time per month to keep all the docs in the loop on what's going on with their compensation and their, their incentive goals. And so you send it out you know, by the 15th or 20th of the month, everybody's on the same page and then you kind of move on. And there are very few kind of follow up, hey, Bart, this doesn't look right, or that doesn't look right from an RVU perspective, because they kind of can see the RVUs wax and wane over time, and they know they, they've built up a, a pretty good level of trust with, with the data. So it's, it's been a big win for transparency, I think, and I rarely get questions about the data, which is really a big win from, from where I sit. Well, and Bart, I, I'm curious, you've got it down to this a day a month, which is, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's still a full day, but it's a lot of data that you're crunching and it's so valuable. Mm -hmm. How did you get, how long did it take you to get to that point? I can imagine there's practice administrators and program administrators out there going, oh, this sounds like a lot. I don't have time. How did you get to the point where you could deliver these in an efficient way? So, so some of it's just kind of the blood, sweat and tears of kind of the architecture of the underlying reports, right? Because I mean, you know, part of the day that it takes me to do it is because I have to do an APP productivity report. Then I have to download my patient satisfaction to a different report. Then I have to download my, you know, quality information from another report. And kind of once you build those underlying, you know, lead reports in underneath the, the master scorecard, then it's just a matter of kind of pulling data in uh, with, you know, some maybe complicated Excel formulas, but <laughs> but kind of pulling that information in at the end of the month, and then and then PDF and scorecards and sending them out the door. So, it sometimes it, it it takes a while to kind of build those underlying reports from an architecture perspective, but it's always worth it mm -hmm. because you, then you get the you get the win every single month afterwards. Just with the uh, hey, I've got this clean architecture underneath. I can just kind of hit refresh. The data populates, I trust it, and I, I PDF it, and I move on, and I send it out to my docs. So, yes, you know, sometimes it may it may seem like it takes a while to get something up and running the first two, three, four months, but kind of once it's up and running, you feel good about it because it really helps you with your efficiency in, in terms of being able to push out this volume of reports on this regular basis. And it's worth the effort. Yep. Let's move over and talk about non-provider staff and expenses. You did a, a workflow analysis as part of all this. How did that come about? What did you learn from it? 
Well, I'll, I'll start here. You know, I think that as we began this work and we saw the initially the variation in the staffing ratios that we had site by site, one of the issues that or questions that immediately arose was, well, how do we get the work done? Who does what? What is the role of the nurse at this practice versus the medical assistant at that practice? Um, what should be the standard work amongst our physicians with respect to, uh, you know, his or her interaction with the EMR in terms of, um, you know, documentation and orders and that type of stuff. So, you know, in the beginning, we found that we had probably, you know, 20 different practices at 20 different site locations. And we had to begin to constrain that variance through, you know, conversation. But as we began to do that, um, that's when the efficiencies began to arise. You know, one in particular, one area in particular that was a blind spot for us is we began to add APPs to the office to be true members of a care team and seeing return patients and developing that rapport with patients and, you know, the patients really, you know, grabbed onto it. We realized that we hadn't staffed the office for the APP as a provider you know, needing the medical office assistant to help with the vital signs and all of that that we would have for, you know, the physician in the office. It was just mm -hmm. a blind spot. But as we went through and realized it, you know, if we're really subscribing to the concept of division of labor and everybody at top of license, then we really have to build it off of, you know, some kind of metric. And that's where using the RVU metric really becomes important because when the APP is in the office, he or she is, you know, generating RVUs, and we can use that as part of our staff equation. So I would say like any other change, you know, change in human behavior, it's always a little bit tough, but it's got to start somewhere, and it's got to be informed by data, and that's what this process really helped us with. Did you do this internally, or did you use outside consultants or any help from the health system to do these analyses, Bart? Yeah, so so the, the way we did this analysis is in the same kind of four buckets we talked about earlier with respect to staff FTs per 10,000 RVU. So if you've got a cohort of, say, our, our biggest three practices, and, and one of them is at you know, two, two staff FTs per 10,000 RVU, the next one's at 2.5, the next one's at 2.75, you start to wonder, okay, well, what's the difference? And then you get down to the job code level, right, for the for the three different practices. And then you're looking at, you know, what what is the number of check-in, check-out employees at one place versus another? Okay, well, you know, I'm looking at my dashboard right here. I've got in my biggest practice, I have 12.5 check-in, check-out employees. Now it's a really big practice. Then I compare that to the two others, and they're at six or eight, right? So then you start saying, well, what's the difference between 12 at one practice and six or eight at another? That, that's not purely volume driven. It's some of it might be process driven. Mm -hmm. So how can we kind of streamline those duties at the check in check out uh, section? Or then it, you, you might have the same conversation with um, the, the level of device nurses you have in a practice or the like Dr. Rose said, the number of CMAs you have at a practice. Now, we, we noticed that our biggest practice had 15 nurses. Well, the, the second and third largest had five each. Well, what's the difference between 15, five, and five, there's, mm -hmm. there's a workflow process that had to be worked out there to say, you know, maybe we don't need, you know, 12 nurses for 12 docs in the office. Maybe we can get by with eight or nine and we could reassign some kind of duties kind of within our care team, or even we reassigned a couple of those nurses from the heavier practice to some of the, in the lighter practices over time. So well, it's, re it's really that job code level detail that you have to be able to look at. And, and we, we, we did a lot of this work in advance of the budget year starting, right? So you, okay. you get to the point where your year is starting and you're like, okay, I know starting this year off, I need to shift probably two nurses or two CMAs out of this practice and into this one for consistency's sake um, with kind of the new workflow that you've worked out but, you know, within your practice. Well, and how did, did you engage the existing employees and uh, I'm sure you mentioned process a couple of times and workflow change and shifting people. Did you involve them in the change process in, in modifying those, those actual workflows? Did they lead that process? I, so often yeah. do staff get so afraid of these changes. How did you engage them in it? So what, what, what we did after we created this, these, these dashboards that kind of created the spotlight onto the by job code, by practice differences is we pulled together a lot of our clinical supervisors, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, we have three clinical supervisors of our three largest practices that are separated by 20 or 30 miles each, right? So you get them all into a room and you talk about, 
well, how can you survive with, with five nurses when it takes me 15? And you just kind of, then there's a reconciliation process that starts from there to say, you know, well, maybe this duty is not a nurse duty. Maybe it's a CMA duty, or maybe, maybe there's a few steps we can save here versus there, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it really, it wasn't up to me as an administrator to say, well, you're, you're heavy on nurses, you're heavy on CMAs, or you don't have enough check in, check out. It really is the folks that have the boots on the ground that are kind of need to help build those strategies. And we did it by connecting the clinical supervisors to first figure out some efficiencies in the biggest practices and then help spread them to the medium and smaller practices within the region. That's really smart. You basically let them solve the problem. I mean, yep. you, you let them talk it through and figure out how they, they created their own best practices across across the sites. That's really That's right. smart. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really creates a vehicle for identifying best practice and then really uh, scaling best practice, mm -hmm. you know, scaling the, you know, what they call the positive deviance, right? So when we, when we find that and we find that somebody's really landed on the right connection, what was the secret of that success? Let's understand it and then let's replicate that. And, you know, again, five years ago, we just weren't at that place as an organization with, with the, you know, a degree of awareness or sophistication to really kind of tackle those things. But as you go on in time, you begin to have a little bit of capability to do that. And, you know, that's how we got to that point. Then you have to go through the change management, you know, phase, which is one, if you've got buy-in from the team that they own the solution, that's a great first pass. Um, then getting the physicians and APPs on board to understand why you're making changes in the office, uh, you know, is a whole other exercise, but one that you have to engage in as well. Yep. Yep. That's really smart. Uh, we're going to wrap things up and I would like to close it off. If each of you could give listeners your, like a great piece of advice about appropriately staffing their programs, what would that be? What comes to mind first? And uh, Bart, let's start with you. Well, I think it's what you just mentioned. I think it's, you know, as an administrator, helping identify where those gaps, where those pockets of, of improvement may be, and then, and then letting the clinical employees, the providers, and the staff kind of help run with the solution. Um, I, you know, I, I think they're the experts in how the, their world works each and every day. And while we can certainly help identify where some opportunities may exist, it's really up to them to help find a solution and, and you know, just bring it home at the end of the day. Great. Dr. Rose? It, it starts with being data-driven because then, then you've got, when there's no crisis and there's no emergency, everybody understands where you're coming from in terms of how you're staffed. Because invariably in medicine, there's going to be the unpredictable day. There's going to be the, you know, two people called out sick and four people needed to be added onto the office today. Mm -hmm. And when people don't have confidence in the environment, that it was, you know, that this is, yes, an unusual day and I'll roll up my sleeves and get through it. If they feel that the environment is just devoid of the necessary resources because no one's really looked at it, it's a whole different dynamic. So I think that, you know, taking care of, of, of patients day in and day out is, is incredibly hard and incredibly complex, but there has to be a structure that undergirds that to some degree and, you know, that's what we've really tried to get at, you know, through these systems and through this data. Well, it certainly sounds like you have, and your success is undeniable. So we really appreciate your time, Dr. Rose. Bart, thank you so much for being our guests on MedAxiom Heart Talk today. Thanks so much thank for you. having us. Thank you. That wraps up this episode of MedAxiom Heart Talk. If you liked today's episode, Please subscribe if you haven't already so you can automatically re receive updates when we post new episodes and recommend us to a colleague. We'd also appreciate if you could review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you'd like to give us feedback directly or make a suggestion about future guests or topics, please send an email to hearttalk at medaxium.com. <laughs>